Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, I've got a little discussion or whatever you want to call it. I'd like to pass by you. First, I was looking in through my emails, right? And I come on Dawn's newsletter. All right, here is a word, supposedly, from the Lord that says, here, let me start, let me back up. As some of you may know, I I am contemplating, planning on, moving to the sixth floor on the west side. The only negative I can think about it is in the summer, the sun will be very hot coming in that western side. But we have the ability to turn the air condition down and I can put up those, I have those curtains that keep the wind out maybe it'll help keep the sun out all right so anyway i've been praying lord should i do this should i do this now is this a bad time to even be thinking about it and the thing of it is i can't do anything i can't do it on my own i've got to hire somebody see if a local church will help and I'd still want to give them a donation but um, anyway the point is I've been praying about it expecting the Lord to tell me yes go ahead and go or no you should stay where you are and you don't have time to worry about that and, you know something, something anything well in today's uh, different messages that that people say they've gotten from the Lord, and I'm not saying they haven't. This one is from Kevin Robinson, put up today, December 12th. And it says, let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Now is not the time for indecisiveness. There is no time like the present to get on the move in regards to things you have been contemplating. Do not let procrastination get the best of you. I mean, it feels like he's talking right at me. And that's how I, I, I was like, whoa, you know, like he put this up just for me, but I'm sure he didn't. Anyway, he says, you can and will second-guess yourself all day long. Seize the opportunity to ensure your connection with what is ahead. Take steps of faith. You've got this. And I thought, okay, Lord, I'm taking that as a go-ahead. Well, then I read this, uh, the James 1, 2, 2 in the Message Bible. Now, this is kind of getting into a little different subject. Remember last night, I put up the video, if you saw it, if you haven't yet, you might want to, talking about the, well, it was about the books of the Apocrypha, and I mentioned in there, I think, other versions and how all the versions of the Bible were incorrect and uh, that the Apocrypha was still in the, the, uh, the very first King James, I want to say 1611 version. Okay, and then someone decided they didn't want those uh, 12 books in there. They wanted 66 books in the Bible. I don't think that was just a coincidence. All right, the point is, this is in the Message Bible. And I did buy my grandson one of these when he was like 11 or 12, and I told him, I said, this is more like reading a novel. When you read something that goes against something you've been taught, go to your other Bible that your mama got you. It's an ESV. Or go to her and say, Mama, this Bible says, blah, 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 whatever. That doesn't sound right. And then she could help him. And I said, 
um, I told him, I said, I don't consider it a Bible. I consider it more of uh, the word with commentary. And some of it might not exactly line up with the Bible. Now, some of you may not agree with that. But I was letting his mama know I got it for him because he might find it easier to read. And being in the Word is better than not. I don't know, is it? That's something I can ask y'all. Is it of your opinion that it would be better for somebody who understands the Message Bible to read that over, say, the English Standard Version? Okay, this says, James 1, 2, 2. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but. Letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who have glanced in the mirror. That's probably supposed to be glanced in the mirror. Walk away and two minutes later have no idea who they are, what they look like. And again, that was from Kevin Robinson. So I thought, oh, I'm going to look up James 1.22 because it doesn't really sound right. But when you think about it, now let me pull back up my Blue Letter Bible. All right, James 1.22 says, But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Now, I'm in the NASB. If we take it to the King James, it says, But if, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Well, that, see, I, I get the same understanding of it. All right. So anyway, that's how I came to get to James one twenty two. All right, so then I just wanted to keep reading. For if anyone is a hearer, I'm back in NASB now. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who, now here's what, here's the point I wanted to make out of all this. I got an answer to my prayer and now this. But one who looks intently at the perfect law the law of liberty and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This man's religion is worthless. Let me repeat that. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Now that was kind of surprising that James would end his this chapter with that because to me 
pure and undefiled religion would be to follow the two commandments Jesus gave us, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself, which would include visiting orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. But you see, the... What hit me about this is there, the Christmas thing. So many people do not feel the liberty to practice or celebrate the coming of our Savior into this world because of what pagans did four or five thousand years ago. You can't let it go. Pagans did that, but we do something entirely different. I make it all about Jesus, and you can thumb me down. I don't care. I'm being honest. We have a law of liberty. We have freedom to do whatever is not sin. And in Jeremiah, which was written in the Old Testament anyway, not that, see, the any law given in the Old Testament was to the Jews. And Jesus died to free them so they would have the law of liberty. That chapter in Jeremiah chapter 10, it talks about cutting down the tree, nailing wood to the bottom so it would stand, and then decking it with silver and gold. And if you stop right there at verse 3, that sounds kind of like a Christmas tree, doesn't it? But then you, you don't really keep going, a lot of people. They whittle it. How can you whittle the tree if it still has branches? You can't. They cut off all the branches and throw them aside. They want an oak tree. They want a bunch of wood. They want to whittle that thing into an idol that looks like a statue. Then they take the metal. Keep reading on down. You'll talk about them melting the silver. They would melt the silver or the gold, pour it into thin sheets. And that stuff would be like working with with. A fine fabric. You could lift it up, lay it on the wooden idol, and hammer it with a hammer. I imagine you would gently tap it, maybe put a cloth over it even, and then do it. But anyway, you would overlay the silver and or gold onto this creature looking thing whatever maybe you made an owl maybe you made a fish maybe you made a person looking thing a statue of diana that was one of the roman god goddesses you see what i'm saying but they had to carry it with the sticks they nailed to the bottom they were used to carry it because it could not walk and it could not talk mentions in that paragraph in Jeremiah 10 how I think it goes through verse 9 how they could not walk and they could not talk so you don't have to be afraid of it okay it is not a Christmas tree trees didn't come along until the 1800s in Germany I believe because evergreens were used as a symbol of see not everything dies now if you're bringing an evergreen tree or evergreen boughs or uh, garland into your home because of the, what the pagans did and you got them in your mind well they did it so we're gonna do it I doubt you are because you didn't learn that. That's not what we do. We do it because they smell good. It's part of the winter decoration, whatever. 
You don't have to bring anything into your home. But I'm going to put my nativity scenes up and I decorate for winter. And however you feel that it is about that, then, you know, keep it to yourself because the look, but one who looks intently, let's see, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. And this is what I think about people who just can't get it. They don't understand our faith to know that we have a law of liberty to do things like keep a holiday but not do it like the world with all the drinking and other stuff that goes with that because then it becomes unholy and then it becomes not about God. I hope you can see that. I used to have a Christmas tree after I did the freedom thing, it would be all red, white, and blue. And it was about the blood of the lamb, the purity he brings. And the blue just made it about liberty. Uh, the liberty we have in America to celebrate. I mean, it was just all about freedom. I called it my freedom tree. Well, then I got over that. And it became all about Jesus. I, I found these ornaments with the nativity scenes on them and uh, another set the same year they came out at Walmart with the magi going around and it was repeated on the other side and they were so beautiful and I used those I put crosses of different kinds just stuff like that you know and it was just all about Jesus and an angel at the top to represent the angels that came to the shepherd boys to announce your Savior has been born. You see, you can really make a wonderful, uh, how do I say it, gift for the Lord and keep it and sing religious Christmas songs or Christian Christmas songs. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to heaven above. Yeah, I changed the words a little bit. That's my version. I sang it through the whole song and, and um, they didn't give me a strike because I didn't write the notes, the music. Um, I forget what they called it. They tagged it as having copyrighted content. So anyway, you get the point. And I sing that all the time now, <laughs> all year round, because I made it about the rapture. Anyway, I'm going to stop it here, I guess. I've said all I'm going to say. Know that you've got the law of liberty. You, you don't have the freedom to hurt people because that goes against the two commandments, to love your neighbor as yourself. You don't have the liberty to say whatever you want to say if it's going to hurt people or go against the first commandment. Remember that. All right, with that I'll say I plead the blood of Jesus over this video and the internet connection and over each and every one of you and your devices and over my computer and your internet connections so we can stay connected until we're out of here. And even though it doesn't look like it's going to be today because, you know, Steve Fletcher said tonight at 12-12, but after midnight, it becomes the 13th. So, December 12th, 1212 a.m. has passed for Eastern Standard Time. And that's when that 
celestial thing, whatever it was, the conjunction, or the kiss, the, the full moon at its biggest, whatever it was, was going to happen at 1212. But didn't it give us a little more hope to keep going? So that's what we got to do. Take it as a something to, you know, another thing to look forward to when we keep on looking. You keep looking up. Our redemption draws nigh. With that, I'll say bye for now. I'll talk to you later.